So in this video, we are going to start our discussion on test benches. Uh, this is a very important topic and it's slightly large topic also. So we'll cover in multiple tutorials. So let me try to motivate why we need test bench. Okay, so till now we have designed many circuits using Virlo. And after designing any circuit, uh, one important aspect is checking whether your circuit is working properly or not. Okay, so that's what we call as verification. And we were verifying whether our circuit is working or not uh, through simulation. So we use this model sim simulator. Okay, within model sim, we use the wave window to do this. So we directly add the signals there. Then we forced uh, the input signals and we check the output signals and we said like, okay, this is working fine. This will work for very small designs. But as your design hardware complexity increases, this wave window based simulation becomes very difficult. And again, when you have thousands of inputs and hundreds of outputs and hundreds of intermediate signals, uh, it becomes almost impossible you do this manual verification, sitting there, forcing signals and see the output and checking whether it is working or not. So there should be some way to overcome it. Uh, ultimately, we want to do an automation where I write something, uh, some code, and that code will check my circuit whether it is working or not, and it will tell me whether it is working or not. If we go one step further, maybe it can even tell me uh, where the error is happening. So that's something which is used for testing, verifying your design is called as test ventures. Now test ventures, uh, they can be written in HDL languages, okay, VHDL and Vidlock, you can write it, or there are specialized languages for writing test benches. Uh, for example, system with log, uh, which can be used for designing your circuit also, but it is more popular for writing these uh, verification platforms, test benches. Also nowadays, you can write your test benches in high level languages also. So you can write it in uh, C language also. And there are even very specialized languages for verification, such as E language. Okay. Uh, maybe when you go for uh, some industrial job, you will find like uh, they are using e-verification language and other platforms like uh, Pacman or Vera, uh, specific platform for verification. But for our course, for verification, we are going to use simulation and we are again going to use model sim. And writing this verification environment, we will still use Verilog. So in the introductory lecture, a uh, few lectures back, I mentioned uh, one motivation for hardware description languages was to make verification easier. Okay. There was no uh, no intention of using it for designing at that time, that we did later. Okay, now let me show you the overall idea some pictorially. So we will design some hardware, okay. uh, so which will have some inputs and output, which we want to test now. When you want to test this, uh, what you basically model is the environment in which the circuit is going to sit. Okay, so we will model this entire environment where this guy will be sitting. So this is your hardware and this is this environment. Your hardware under this environment, we usually call it uh, design under test or unit under test. So you usually see people write either DUT or UUT. Okay, design under test or unit under test. That's what we call our hardware, which we are going to verify. And this entire environment is modeled by our so-called test bench. So we usually write TB for test bench. So what the TB does, he will inject the inputs to your design. Okay, so he will create some input signals and he will inject those inputs here. Uh, same way, he will take the output from your design. So we'll have some other logic sitting here, which will accept the output and will basically verify whether your circuit is working properly or not. Okay, so there should be some way for the test bench to know uh, what will be the expected output. Uh, so he is giving the input. Of course, he can calculate uh, what will be the output and he will compare that expected output from this 
uh, hardware output. Now, if you ask like, okay, uh, if I use the same logic for designing my hardware and designing the so-called test bench, this environment, of course they will match. Okay, uh, we'll have some bias there. So in industry, how it usually happens is the people who design this actual hardware will be separate from the people who are designing these test benches. So we will have people called uh, verification engineers. So if you look at the job description, you will see like companies, they ask for verification engineers specifically. They are the one who are modeling this environment. They are the one who are writing this test bench. Guys who write this hardware, uh, nowadays they are usually called as RTL. Uh, design engineers or design engineers usually RTL stands for register transfer level uh, what exactly is RTL and what does it mean nowadays I will discuss later so these are the guys who are writing this hardware these are the guys who are writing this one okay. so they won't we'll say like they don't talk to each other so ideally uh, they'll be using their own logic for writing this one and writing this one Another catch is, this I have mentioned before, the circuit that you are going to describe here should be synthesizable. Synthesizable. That means there should be some way to implement it on real hardware. This environment that is used only for verification purpose to check whether it is working or not. So it is not mandatory your test bench should be synthesizable. And in most of the cases, Test benches are non synthesizable. That means you cannot directly put it into uh, some real hardware. Okay. So there is more flexibility for those who are writing test bench. So when I say non synthesizable, uh, test benches give more options like our traditional programming languages. You can do print function, you can show something on the screen, you can read from file, you can write to file, all these things. Uh, real hardware chips, they cannot directly do these kind of things. Right? So there is more flexibility for TBs, uh, they need not be synthesizable, but there are uh, very specific cases where we will write synthesizable test benches. That means these test benches can be also put into hardware and we can do verification. That rarely happens. In most cases, test benches will be non-synthesizable. So because of that, in most cases, uh, the logic used here and the logic used here for generating the expected output uh, might be different. So we do a comparison and the probability of using same logic and uh, having the bias is much lesser. Another one, okay, we uh, spend a lot of time in developing test benches and testing. So industry, we usually say like we spend 40% time uh, for developing our hardware and 60% time in verification. So we want to test all the corner cases. There shouldn't be any any uh, special cases, corner cases, uh, which are omitted during verification. And when you run your circuit on the actual hardware, that condition happens and your circuit fails. So that shouldn't happen. Uh, because of that, uh, we will try to have complete verification, all the logic. Again, it's a big field uh, nowadays. Again, if you are going to industry, you will hear these terminologies like OVM, VMM, etc. Open verification methodology, verification method. So these things, these technologies are again developed for making sure uh, you verify all the parts uh, within the available time. Because for the multi-million gate circuit, it will be impossible to test all the cases uh, because you have limited time to release your product. So we'll use some uh, specific verification methodologies so that almost all corner cases are tested. Now, these technologies they usually use high-level programming languages. And that means your test bench will be written in C or C++, not using HTML languages or even system overload. But we are not going to discuss this. Maybe later uh, we will have some basic test benches uh, to get started with. Another thing you will observe with test benches, they are modeling the environment of the circuit. So test benches, they will not have any input and output. Okay, Everything in the universe except your circuit is modeled by the test bench. So he doesn't have any input from where he will get input or any output where he is going to give any output. So keep that in mind. 
So let's write our first test bench. So of course we should design the hardware. Uh, in industry, this will be happening in parallel. RTL designers, they will be writing the hardware. Uh, test bench engineer, verification engineers, they will be writing the test benches. And it will happen in parallel. Uh, for that to happen in parallel, the interface, the input output of the RTL should be predefined and that should never be changed. Okay. So once that is fixed, these two things can happen in parallel. But since we are doing everything in our course, uh, we can write the test bench after writing our hardware. So the test bench I'm going to write is for this flip-flop, flip-flop with reason. Okay, so that's what I'm going to write. So hardware I have already defined and designed. So we have D flip-flop with reset. You know what are his interfaces. So he needs a clock. He needs a reset. Synchronous, he has a D input and he has a Q output. Now I'm going to write a test bench around this one, which will help me to test this guy. Now, you know, for D flip flop to model, what all things you need. When the wave window, you force the clock signal, right? Now, that clock signal should be provided by the test bench. So we need some logic here. Let's call it maybe clock N. Who will generate the clock signal for me? and inject it to the D flip flop. Then we need some uh, input, uh, let's call driver logic, which will drive this reset signal and the D. And we will have some output verification logic, which will take the output from here and check whether the correct output is coming. Or initially, at least we will try to display what output is coming. So this is what we are aiming. So let's start writing. So first we'll take a new source file, uh, with log itself. So traditionally we will call the bench module as just TB. Okay, so syntax is same, because this is also with log. So module TB, as I mentioned before, there won't be any input output to the test bench. So we put that empty parenthesis there and end module. So let's save it like db.v. So from the figure, you can see the D flip flop or our DOT should be within the TB. So how do we do it here? We will just instantiate our hardware into our test bench. Okay, so let me instantiate it somewhere. Uh, so module name followed by instance name. Instance name, as I mentioned, we usually call DOT or UUT. And we will do the port mapping. Okay, so the first port that we would like to connect is the clock. So our test bench, again like here, should generate a clock signal. Okay. So what I will do is I will take a signal, keep it high for some time, keep it low for some time, keep it high for some time, keep it low for some time. So that we have done in our timer design. You have seen how to generate that square wave. Why that you have a reference clock cycle? Okay, so test bench, it is modeling the entire world. He doesn't have any reference clock cycle. But the advantage here is test benches are non-synthesizable, not need not be. So we have other technique generate a square wave. Okay, so there are many ways. Uh, let me show one of the ways. So I can write like uh, always at a star, looks like a combination logic. I will have a signal, let's say clock, and I will say this signal is not of this signal. Yeah, so if you just do it like that, you'll see this is like a combinator circuit. So this will become one zero one zero one zero. It happens so fast. But for a clock, there should be some delay between this signal transition. Okay, so let's say I want a clock running at 100 megahertz. That means my period is 10 nanoseconds. So I want switching to happen only after every five nanosecond. There is a way to say it. I can write like hash five. Yeah. Okay, so this basically means I need to make this clock signal not clock signal after five units of time. And this will happen Forever, since clock is inside always on the left side, we should declare it as rest type. All those rules are still the same. 
and uh, this signal I can connect here. Now the question is here I am just saying it should toggle after 5 unit of time. What is the unit of time uh, we need to specify whether it is 5 microsecond, 5 nanosecond, 5 microsecond, 5 second, whatever it is we should specify. Yeah. So we need to use a special construct called the time scale. So tick time scale 1 nanosecond by 1 picosecond. Yeah, so you will see in most of the video code uh, that you will encounter written by other people, you will have this statement. This is specifying the scale of time. When I write like this, this first one, you will see like there are two terms here. First one is like the unit of time. So here I have written 1 nanosecond. It means wherever I write hash followed by some number, it is indicating that many nanoseconds. So this is actually indicating 5 nanoseconds. Okay. Hash is used for specifying delays in Wedlock. Hash is used for specifying delays. That's why we don't have hash include, we have tick include. Now the second one, this picosecond, and that stands for the resolution of simulation, which basically means the smallest unit of time that you want to model in your simulation. So the smallest unit I want to model is one picosecond. Now this you can go as small as a femtosecond also. So if you want to model that kind of small time delay, you can put femtosecond. Uh, the catch here is the smaller the time delay that you put here, uh, the more might be the simulation time because the simulation, because the simulator which is a software, you will have to model this kind of small time delays. So that will take more time for the simulation to finish. More about it we will again discuss later. For the time being, remember this is the unit of time, this is the resolution. If you write nanosecond here, everything followed by hash represents these many nanoseconds. If I write uh, microsecond US, it is microsecond. If I write like this, this is 5 microsecond. Let's put it back. 5 nanosecond. So let's quickly simulate and see whether things are working. Now, so first we have to, of course, compile our test bench also, pp.v. I made a spelling mistake, it is time scale. Yeah. Silly mistake. Uh, no errors. Now, your RTL module that should be also compiled if it is not compiled before. So let's compile anyway. pff.v. Now we can simulate. You should be simulating the test bench. Okay, we sim workload TB. Now when the simulator loads the wave window, you can see TB is there. Under TB, you have the DUB. Now let's anyway add everything to waveform. See whether our clock signal is coming. So you can see there is this clock signal and we set uh, 10 nanosecond period so simulation time let's put 10 nanosecond and let's try to run and you will see the clock is always a red color and it is written X here. Now the logic levels in Wedlock I will discuss in a tutorial soon. So X means unknown, undefined. Uh, he is saying like value of clock is undefined. So let's come back to our code quickly. So here I simply wrote clock equal to not clock. Okay. Now the catch is uh, when you declare any signal as a reg type and if it is not driven by any other signal, when the simulation begins, the value of this register will be unknown. And Whitlock indicates unknown by x. So here I wrote like after every five unit of time, make is not clock so he is basically doing uh, unknown is not of unknown which is also unknown okay. so what like in our software uh, if you are simply declaring a reg variable like this you should specify at the beginning of the simulation what should be its value previously we never faced this issue because our inputs were coming from external world only our outputs were reg type which was driven by some internal logic so it will always have some value that we give some input values. Uh, this one is not driven by any external logic and this is some internal signal kind of thing so you should specify the initial value. You can simply write equal to zero uh, like software so we need to recompile 
only touch punch recompile and restart and let's run again and this time it appears like the clock is constantly one okay so uh, initialization value dot it as zero but uh, here it became zero to one and is stuck at one it is supposed to toggle after five nanoseconds but that is not happening okay so let's go back to the code and see what is really happening okay so in the code i set like clock equal to zero and this is where it is supposed to toggle. now look at the always block here this we discussed before so this looks like a combinational circuit always block because the sensitivity list i put star that means any signal on the right hand side of assignment changes uh, is always block is supposed to run right okay so let's see what really happened so when the simulation starts uh, clock the value zero from unknown it became zero so there is some change in clock so the always block runs so it changes and uh, signal on the right hand side change the always block executes so he will change this zero to one and this clock will get one and he will wait for five nanosecond right for the clock to again go back to zero what should happen some signal in the sensitivity list change should change but nothing happens it never changes because the only thing in sensitivity list is clock so this is more like a chicken and egg problem for the clock to change the clock should change this kind of thing so that's why he is stuck at one so what we should do we will simply remove this sensitivity list it's like an infinite loop now so always without any sensitivity clock is not clock wait for five unit okay. so it will be zero first it will become one wait for five unit and again become zero wait for five unit again becomes zero so and so forth so again we have to recompile restart i am showing you all these errors uh, because these errors you might encounter when you write the code and let's see and this time you can see uh, we have the square wave coming and let's see where the edge is changing it is changing at 5000 picosecond is five nanosecond right so that's how we generated the clock now there are other ways also writing this clock signal let me try to show you some of them so one thing in uh, wedlock almost in none of the wedlock code you will see people initializing a signal like this instead we use another block called the initial block okay again you can see it's a keyword it's quite similar to always block uh, the difference is always block is like an infinite loop so whatever you write under always block if there is no sensitivity list it will run infinitely if there is a sensitivity list whenever things in sensitivity list changes it will run but whatever you write under initial block will be executed only once at the beginning of simulation okay so here i can write like block equal to zero like this instead of this one so at the beginning of simulation clock gets zero and this happens only once then this thing happens again every signal on the left hand side of initial block should be also reg type uh, that is a root so you can see exactly same thing will happen if i recompile uh, restart and if i run again same clock signal now another style we usually use is we do not separate this initial block and this always block instead we will write something like this okay, let me comment this out we will use another keyword uh, forever see these things forever and all uh, you cannot use when you are writing synthesizable code this cannot be synthesized forever forever is used for representing an infinite loop so instead of writing always block without sensitivity you write simply forever and there you can write again begin and we need uh, same thing clock is not clock and wait for five units of time why i wrote like this because i want to keep clock driving logic as a single block now you can see it's a single block so let's recompile again 
restart and run again fine still same thing so let me repeat uh, most of the thing that we write here are non-synthesizable you can write like this only for test bench for example this delay delays using this hash can never be realized on a real hardware if that was possible life would have been very easy uh, previously we saw like we designed timers so that i get a uh, very specific timing delay right if this were synthesizable this hash thing i don't have to do anything like that if i need one second delay i just put one here and put second here and somehow magically uh, that circuit gets implemented it doesn't happen okay so style you can use only for test benches for our is non-synthesizable initial block okay whether it is synthesizable or non-synthesizable depends uh, if you are aiming for fpga designs uh, many of the initial blocks are synthesizable you can actually build them into hardware if you are using them for asic design application specific ic's uh, dedicated chips they are non-synthesizable again initial block we will uh, come back in detail so clock is done now we are left with dr as the input so first let's apply some reset and see whether it is working right so in, in wave-based simulation also that's what we did we applied reset and we check whether output is becoming high or not so what i can do i can again write an initial block because i want to apply this reset only once I will create another signal called reset here again inside always block I am using left side so should be declared as reg type and I am saying initial reset equal to 1 that means at the beginning of the simulation reset signal will become high like multiple always block multiple initial blocks they are also running in parallel okay so this guy will be running the clock generating the clock parallelly this will be happening at the beginning of simulation reset is 1. If you don't write this at the beginning of simulation, reset is unknown, x. We need some value. And we will apply reset for some time. We will keep it high for some time. How long we should keep it? Let's say some, some random time. Since it is synchronous, it should be high at least for one clock cycle. Okay, it's for 10 nanoseconds. Let's keep it high for 100 nanoseconds. Okay, I made it high. After that, I made a reset signal low. Fine. So you can observe what is happening in the output. So let's put in here. Let's take this reset and let's connect it to R here. Uh, let's recompile and restart. Okay. So in the wave window, I would like to see this reset signal also. So I will go here. I will again add to wave. So he will add everything again so I can see clock and reset. I would also like to see what output is coming out of the flip flop. That will not automatically come here. When you right click a module and say add module, it will show only the input output and intermediate signals of that module. Since TB doesn't have any input output, that is not here. These two are declared inside TB, so they are coming. If I want to see the input output from this guy, I need to click that and say add. So now I can see clock D R Q. Uh, let me put a divider. Yeah, so I can put divider and let's say D flip flop there. And this divider I can put here so that I can easily see. Okay, now let's run. So you can see this clock is from T B. This clock is the input clock of D flip flop. Since we instantiated, this is coming here also. So reset I made high here. He is getting that reset because of that my Q output is low. This D is the input to the D flip flop. It is blue in color. I guess I mentioned before. Blue stands for high impedance. Red stands for unknown. In stands for one or zero. These are the default colors. Of course, you can go to settings and change them. But these are the default color. It's blue because this is an input, and he's basically saying nobody is drawing the input. That is why it is blue. Okay, so let's see. Uh, whether reset gets deasserted after 100 nanosecond. Okay, so let's run for some time. And 
you can see after 100 nanosecond here exactly uh, reset became blue so he also got reset low and q became blue because we wrote like if there is no reset output is same as input so input is blue so output also became blue in real hardware it never happens like that okay in real hardware the input will always have some value one or zero there is no uh, question like nothing is connected okay so we need to drive these inputs also so let's go back and try that but if you wish you can write it in a separate initial block or can use the same initial block let me use the same initial block so let's call it uh, in d or something to indicate that is the d input again let me make it as when you start the simulation as zero after 100 nanosecond i remove the reset let's wait for another 100 nanosecond and uh, make it one and maybe wait another 100 nanosecond and uh, make it zero okay of course none of these are synthesizable okay? only for modeling i'm writing synthesizable code you can never write like this because here you can see it is clearly sequential execution first this happened then it happened 100 then this then this then this okay and let's connect this in d here okay, we need to recompile and restart and let's run here let me put some large value of 100 nanosecond for one click okay 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 so let's see what really happened so this time uh you can add the d here also but i can look at the same d at the beginning it is zero and you can see here it became high then 200 nanosecond why because initially it is zero here 100 delay here another 100 delay after that only it is becoming one so at, from the beginning of simulation after 200 nanosecond became high here 300 nanosecond it became low now look at the value of q q became high here q became low here do you find any issue here this is not the way it behaved when we did it using forcing right you remember flip flop it is supposed to add one clock latency i made d high here but q immediately became high here here i made d low here here he immediately became low so what is happening if you clearly understood the behavior of blocking assignment statement you should be able to tell it. okay so whenever we are forcing using wave into value of signal will be coming delta t after the clock edge okay now when you are directly modeling it using code uh, you have two options you can either use this guy or you can use this one so when you are using this one that means the value of d immediately changes okay? at the clock edge this is the value so that is why if you ask me now what is the value of d here at the clock edge it is one that is why q also got one same here d became zero so q became zero if you really want to model it uh, we want to model like my input d is changing slightly after the clock edge that is how it happens in real world also not on exact clock edge so how can you do it do it first of all you may you want to make sure d is changing only after a clock edge so basically from the simulator i will say wait for a clock edge so if i write something like this again non-synthesizable only in db okay so you can write like this at for such clock inside this initial block so this basically means okay make reset zero wait for 100 nanosecond after that wait for the next clock edge that is what this means okay then make d1 using our non-blocking assignment 
then again wait for 100 then wait for next edge of the clock then make it zero now let's see what happens compile we start run now you can see uh, d became high here but the value of d at the edge is zero only after h it became one so q became one here same way here also now to really really show it we usually put some delay after the clock edge when d changes in real world that how it happens exactly how much time depends upon the specific uh, technology that we are using okay for the time being let me put one there that means after clock edge after one nanosecond d changes so here also hash one now it is much more clearer start and let's run it so you can see like if i zoom in here is the clock edge d is changing one nanosecond after the clock edge so no confusion q changed on the next clock edge. in real world this q will also come after the clock edge uh, depending upon the propagation delay of the flip-flop how to model the propagation delay of flip-flop we will see uh, later that is the rtl part we will see later okay so everything seems fine now only thing left is the output checking the output okay now you have to connect some signal here let's call it out q what should be the type remember any signal that you connect to the output of the module should be declared wire type so it should be wire type okay okay so let me uh, show you some other thing I just want to print uh, what output is coming and I want to print only when that output is changed. To do that, Verilo gives a system function or a built-in function called dollar monitor. Okay. So dollar monitor, uh, let me first type then I will show you. Okay. So let me simply type value of Q is percentage D comma okay, out Q. Looks very similar to printer function in C. So in fact, it is doing the same thing. Uh, but the difference is this function will be automatically called whenever the signal, any signal, you can have more than one also, any signal specified within the function changes. Okay. It's a system task. So in Verilog, anything starting with a dollar is called a, a system task. These are built-in tasks and functions. Again, difference between task and function we will uh, discuss later. Now, you cannot put dollar monitor as a standard on function like this. It should be put within an initial block. Okay. Now, dollar monitor, it has an infinite loop internally. Uh, that's why whenever the signal changes, it gets executed. Okay. So, also you put it inside initial block, which runs only once. This is like an infinite loop inside that. So, you'll never come out of this infinite loop don't put it inside always block if you put it always block always block itself is an infinite loop within that you have another infinite loop so most probably your system will just hang nothing will happen okay so let's try this out recompile and restart and let's run it and let me put it back so when you run your simulation, you will see the print is coming. Value of Q is 0. Value of Q is 1. Value of Q is 0. So on and so forth, right? It will not always come. As I mentioned, it will come only when the value of the signal changes. Okay? That is why they are coming here. Now, it will be more interesting if you, if you can say like when the value is changing instead of looking at the wave window for that we again have a system task called dollar time so dollar time will print the current simulation time 
and after that you can put some comma each comma will give you one space okay so that's a good thing so again recompile and restart and run so here you can see time is here because it is justified uh, at 0 q is 0 at 210 it became 1 320 it became 0 now it will never change because it is never changing so again roller monitor you can use only in this benches uh, now comparing the input and checking whether the output is correct or not okay that let's do in a separate tutorial uh, i guess this will help you to start writing test benches for all the hardware that we have designed till now okay thank you and see you in the next tutorial